Bob Barr is running for Congress again, and that's very, very exciting. BarrCongress.com. Maybe he can go in there and bar them, pun intended, from uh, uh, totally overthrowing the republic. This is a guy who decades ago uh, was a leading voice and, and has continued to be one warning of growing tyranny. And he's got uh, Liberty Guard trying to uh, uh, restrict and, and bar what the uh, TSA has been up to and all those outrages. We see that picking up steam in Congress uh, right now to, to make them not bark orders and grab people's genitals and all the rest of it. So there is an awakening going on. And he's also been writing for Town Hall uh, dealing with the NSA. Of course, he was in the CIA as well. And so that gives Bob Barr a unique perspective uh, on really uh, the ins and outs of government and how it works. His latest article is Transparency Through a Glass Darkly. And, and uh, you know, I knew that he was going to be running for, for, for Congress again, I, but I, I just, it just like literally just hit me that, that he's running and we need to support him and get him in there. And people say, well, he was in the CIA. He must be bad. Ladies and gentlemen, government's all compartmentalized. And people in the military and people I know that have been in the CIA are some of the most patriotic, informed, hardworking people. It's that there's compartmentalized groups using national security covers to be able to carry out their own nefarious deeds. That's why we need transparency. And that's why he's always been a leading light in transparency. And I only raise that because it's not even really ever a controversy. I just hear, well, he says a lot of good stuff, but he's in the CIA. He, he's helped get a lot of good legislation passed and has helped block a lot of legislation. We don't have Ron Paul in Congress anymore. He was in Congress, got out of Congress, got back in Congress. We need to send Bob Barr back to Congress. And I didn't mean to turn this into a campaign promotion here, but uh, it just hit me. Well, I've got Bob Barr on. I'm about to interrogate him about the NSA and all the stuff that's going on and, and you know, get his take on it and how to turn it around. And, and I'm not even going to mention he's running for Congress. So first off, sir, glad that you're throwing your hat back in the ring. I know it's a lot of work, and uh, but we really appreciate that. And tell us about the campaign and what your goals are there in Georgia. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor once again to uh, to be with you and your many many listeners uh, across the land. Uh, yeah, uh, I was at a at a forum last night uh, just outside of Atlanta, where my district is, uh, and I was asked a question. Uh, you know, you served in the Congress before. You were President Reagan's U.S. Attorney. You have background in the CIA. You know, you could just sort of retire and sit back and take it easy. Why are you getting back into the fray? Why are you running again for the Congress? And I said, it's simple. I love this country too much not to get back into the arena. Uh, with what I see happening, Alex, you were there. You mentioned a couple of the things just a few minutes ago that I was working on uh, years and years ago when I was in the Congress uh, to uh, when we first started to learn about uh, the abuses by NSA and, and the electronic surveillance, uh, the illegal stuff going on, and what the FBI was doing through Project Carnivore and uh, Project Echelon. Uh, and it's even worse nowadays. Uh, the reason why it's so important for you to be continue to be out there to raise these issues, both yourself and your many guests, is because government is constantly and forever, our founding fathers understood this, looking for ways to increase its power at the expense of individual liberty. And if you let up, uh, then uh, it's it's just going to keep going and going and going. It's worse now than it was before, and that's why I want to step in there and make sure that I do my part with whatever years the good Lord has left for me on this earth to reign in government power. I mean, it's it's almost to the point. It's not to the point yet, but it's almost to the point where it's going to be irreversible, and I ain't going to sleep until I do everything I can to stop it. Uh, just following it in the news, even though the media has been trying to ignore you or attack you both, uh, you've got a good chance of winning. What do we do to help get you into Congress for our listeners? Because it doesn't matter if people don't live in Georgia. They should be supporting you however they can uh, because, I mean, absolutely, you, you, you came on this show in the late 90s and, and, and so many times, dozens of times, and it was always the NSA spying, the FBI, carnivore. We got to pass a law. We got to ban this. We got to dismantle this. It's dangerous. Total tyranny. They're going to use it to oppress the press. They're going to use it to, to persecute political enemies. This, this is going to be the end of us. And really, even more than Ron Paul on the subject of NSA and FBI illegal surveillance, you were there because obviously you understand it more than most members of Congress who are just lawyers or just doctors. You know, you've been you know, inside uh, secret operations and things. You understand the dangers. I mean, explain to us, as you've done before, um, why... Uh, basic freedom is based in having privacy, and without privacy, you have no freedom. 
Well, uh, very, very good point, and it's fundamentally important. And uh, to take one of your simpler points first, uh, the fact that, the fact of the matter is we need people up there fighting for individual liberty and fighting against these encroach encroachments by government power who have been there who know what government is doing. I mean, I learned as a, uh, an official with the CIA just one, on one hand how important it is that we have a foreign intelligence agency like the CIA, but how equally important it is to make sure that it is kept within bounds because it is so easy to have that power abused when it is secret. Similarly, when I served as President Reagan's uh, U.S. attorney in, in Atlanta, I learned how important it is certainly to have good prosecutors to uphold, uphold their laws and protect the public. But being on the inside, <laughs> excuse me, I also know just how powerful these agencies are and how easily those powers can be abused. So I really am in, in a unique position in many ways to tackle these problems uh, with regard to the privacy issue, uh, basically what you were doing just a moment ago, Alex, in discussing how important it is to retain the right to privacy is quoting uh, or paraphrasing uh, Ayn Rand, uh, as you and I have discussed previously, as uh, Ayn Rand said in The Fountainhead toward the end of that great novel on individual freedom and individual power standing up to the government. Uh, Privacy uh, is uh, essential to civilization. Uh, keeping men free from other men is the is the essence of privacy and the essence of civilization. Without privacy, you can have no freedom. You have no civilization. You live in a communal world where everything is controlled by the community, both ideas, uh, money, work product, and so forth. So maintaining the right to privacy as codified, for example, uh, in the fourth uh, Fourth Amendment to our Constitution, that the government cannot invade your privacy by searching your uh, personal uh, records, belongings, things, and homes, uh, is essential uh, to freedom. It's essential to liberty. Uh, our founding fathers uh, understood that. They understood it long before Ayn Rand wrote about it 150 years later in the, uh, in the 1940s. Uh, and what has been happening uh, since the days when I worked at the CIA back in the 19 1970s, where we had a very clear demarcation uh, line, uh, very clearly demarcated between domestic and international affairs. Uh, that line has been blurred to the point where, in the minds of the NSA and these folks up there, like Clapper uh, and uh, the Brennan and the others uh, up there, uh, it no longer exists. Uh, they think that as long as they say we're doing something in the name of national security, as long as we're fighting terrorism, then we can do what whatever we want, wherever we want, to whoever we want. And that is a philosophy that is a recipe for tyranny. Well, it certainly is. And then look at how they've used the NSA on Fox News, the Associated Press, how they've used the IRS to persecute Tea Party pro-life groups. Uh, now they're persecuting secret conservative Hollywood groups. I mean, this is beyond McCarthy times 10. And this is tyranny, and we need to recognize it's already here. It was a Senator Ted Cruz that said that uh, Obama is frightening, uh, that he's terrifying, that he's dangerous. And the media tried to demonize him, but that only backfired on him because the public understands the unitary executive that's been degenerating for a while. I'm not saying Obama's going to stay in office, but they're turning the executive with the bureaucracy and the interests that run it into a, a 2.0 modern synthetic oligarchy or, or, or dictatorship. Uh, you know, those that control the presidency like a like a control panel, a dictatorial control panel. And then the president's kind of a window hanging there. Uh, I mean, hey, do you agree with that analogy? And uh, at what point are we historically? Because, uh, I mean, even Jonathan Turley you know, said we're coming to the point. Other uh, folks have said in Congress that the only option would be armed rebellion, which obviously we don't want and the system set up for that and it, it would cause a civil war. So what do you do then uh, and, and what point have we reached, Congressman? What, what we do is, first of all, at least within my bailiwick uh, running for Congress, we need to get people into Congress and demand that our, our folks in the Congress stand up for what Congress is supposed to stand up for. Congress is not a rubber stamp for a president, despite what Harry Reid might think or what Nancy Pelosi might believe. Congress has to stand up. 
to the president, regardless of the political party of the president, because they are protecting, they are one of, they are in the vanguards, one of the protectors of our fundamental liberty. And part of what Congress has an absolute responsibility to do, and they time and time again in modern years have failed to do this, and that is to stand up to presidents who basically slap Congress around, say, I'm not going to do what the law says. I'm going to pass, uh, sign an executive order and do what I want. I'm not going to do what you, the Congress, have directed by lawfully passed legislation. And Congress sits back, and what do they do, Alex? They say, thank you, sir. May we have another, sir? Every time that happens, we move further down the road toward consolidating absolute power in the presidency and weakening the fundamental pillars of our representative democracy because Congress cedes power to the president when they do not stand up to the president. Sure. That's the problem that we see over and over and over again, and it happens under Republican presidents, the same as Democratic presidents, except this one is much worse. Now, uh, expanding on that, you know, Ted Cruz called him frightening and dangerous. We just pulled up the Houston Chronicle uh, article on that. Uh, how would you describe Obama? I mean, what is the word for it? Because uh, it doesn't matter if it's energy or guns or borders, legalizing the illegals, getting Obamacare passed and saying he'll selectively enforce it. And Congress says, OK, and he'll selectively decide what to do with the NSA. OK, uh, Congress passing the buck. And then the state of Texas was about to pass a law unanimously in the House. So they killed it in the Senate. Uh, two years ago, as you know, and, and then Obama said, I will have F-16s. This was in the news. And it wasn't even a big deal. It was just a footnote. We will blockade aircraft and, and no aircraft will be allowed to fly in Texas. I mean, this is like the stuff that started the Civil War. That's why I'm, I'm going there. I mean, this is already getting crazy. It, it, is, it is no longer hypothetical. When you have statements uh, like that, and when you have statements like the president issued the other day, basically throwing down the gauntlet uh, to the Congress saying, I don't care what you do. I have a pen. I can order people to do what I want, regardless of what Congress says, regardless of what the laws of this country say. And Congress uh, just sits back and does nothing. We, the people, have to rise up and demand that they do something. Get these guys out of office that are in there who just sit back sort of uh, you know, and sleepwalk through their terms in the Congress. We need people that will fight. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm the only one. There are some other good folks up there and some good candidates around the country. But whether it's uh, whether you're talking about immigration law, whether you're talking about national security in Benghazi, whether you're talking about the fundamental right to privacy uh, and uh, allowing NSA to violate the Constitution and the laws of this land, we need people up there that understand these issues and have the backbone, as I've proven I did when I stood up to Bill Clinton and led the impeachment of that scoundrel a generation ago. Uh, we need these people people in the Congress, and that's why I'm running. And we've got Obama saying things like he's good at killing people. I mean, even the people I know that are Army and, and Navy uh, and, uh, you know, Special Forces and, and Marines, I mean, the, guy, the guys, uh, no one, even if he killed people with his bare hands, you don't make statements like I'm good at killing people. I think it shows a narcissistic, really uh, amateurism of Obama, and it, and it frightens me to think, that, that these people are so into red carpets, so into the jets, so into the month-long vacations, to know that even, even if we had a corrupt elite, if they, if they weren't so reckless, it wouldn't be as scary. I mean, I really have never been a, a, you know, a big fan of the theory that it's a government incompetence theory, but more and more you see the foreign policy is uncoordinated. It's crazy. I mean, funding al-Qaeda to attack uh, Syria, what's your take on that? Well, it, it's... On the one hand, one one could be charitable, as as you uncharacteristically were just a moment ago, in saying this is just amateurism. Uh, the, uh, what they're doing, you could you could sort of chalk it up to, well, they just don't really understand the Middle East. They don't understand the international affairs. I mean, after all, this guy was nothing but a, a community organizer and a, and a and a faux constitutional law professor. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, I think it goes deeper than that. Oh, I agree. It goes deeper than simply uh, their amateur. It's worse than they simply don't know what they're doing. 
they have a worldview that is 180 degrees at odds with what the vast majority of our citizens believe and understand and want to see in the world, and that is an America that is strong, that is the shining city on the hill, that is, that uh, carries weight in whatever we do, uh, that is not uh, does not have to count out to communist China because they have uh, $1.3 trillion of our debt uh, in their pocket that they can hold over our head. Uh, that's the sort of thing that costs us dearly, even in non-economic terms as well, because it reduces the flexibility.